Well, good morning, Cameron. Uh, today is the third Sunday of Eastertide. It is April 18th, and um, I don't think we have any big announcements to make at this time. Um, of course, as you all know, we film these in advance, so if anything does happen between the time of filming and, and the day of, we'll send out an email announcement. Um, I think we're still looking for mayonnaise for Rising Hope. And I don't, I don't have any other announcements, do you? Okay. Um, well, let's, um, let's have an opening prayer. Gracious God, we give thanks to you for this opportunity uh, to worship you and to fellowship with one another and to hold each other accountable in Christian love. Lord, we pray that you would guide us by the Holy Spirit. Forgive us our sins and restore us to righteousness. Help us in our efforts to follow the laws and lessons of Jesus, that we may be faithful and joyful in our obedience to our God. We pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You know, I, I, I say in the Holy Ghost because when we went to England, that's how they end their prayers. They say in the name of in the Church of England. And I always thought that sounded scarier. Like the Holy Ghost. It's like scary. You know what I mean? And like, yeah, you don't want to fool around. Like, like you might, you might try to get something by the Holy Spirit, but you're not going to push it with the ghost. He's, he's to get you. All right, um, we're going to sing. I don't even know what to. We're going to sing. Um, we're going. I'll maybe just, we're going to try. All right, we're going to try to sing number three hundred six. Now, Carol tells me that we have sung this before at Cameron during my tenure. That that is also a caveat here. Uh, and I cannot remember it. So, um, Lindsay and I are going to do the best we can with this. We even tried to rehearse this. That's how scared of this thing I am. All right. This is just the introduction. Yeah, just the introduction. All right. She, she's going to play one time through, I think, as the introduction, and then we're going to come in on the hallelujah. Oh. That's, that's not your fault. We just didn't coordinate this battle plan any better than that. Although, to be honest, that's about as good as it's going to get. So um, let's better. just try it. We'll try it one more time. He's going to give us an introduction, and then we're going to start on the hallelujah. Okay. okay. We serve a merciful God. <laughs> you know, I just say that. All right, first reading this morning from Acts, Mr. Robin Shaw. <clears throat> 
A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us, as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and asked for a murder to be granted to you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You have given me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, O people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the righteous as God's own. The Lord hears when I call. Be angry, but do not sin. Commune with your own hearts in your bed and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Lift up your light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. A reading from the first letter of St. John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be Thanks to be God. God. Now, now we're going to get up here and sing a real hymn. Not just one that Carol snuck in there this morning. I, I mean, oh, uh, now, oh, uh, now. All right. Now we're going to sing verses one and two.
have just done three verses of that and called it a day. What do you think? No? All right, all right. It's important to learn new hymns. Even I recognize that. I don't like it, but I recognize it. All right. So, um, uh, let's, let's have uh, the gospel. Um, and y'all can stand up at your house if you want to. Um, I also want to thank Sylvia for that fine reading from 1 John even though it steps all over my toes every time. Oh, John's tough on us now. He's tough. Uh, so from St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. Uh, now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, Peace to you, but they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still not, did not believe for joy and marvel, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things might be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you were witnesses of these things. The Gospel of our Lord. St. Thomas. Um, I do love this account um, because it's the little details where you pick up on stuff, right? The little details that you pick up on stuff. And um, uh, there's a program, it was, uh, I've seen it advertised and I had a, uh, Tim Stewart recommended it to me. He said, Reverend Box, watch this thing and I want to get your opinion on it. And it is a new uh, it's a television show, but you know you got to stream it. It's not on regular TV. It's it, it's one of these streaming shows about Jesus and the apostles, and it's called uh, the Chosen. Has anybody heard about this thing? Um, it's it's produced. Interestingly, it was uh, uh, crowd funded. Um, a church out in Texas, uh, I believe they're in Texas, took it upon. They're, they're one of these big churches. All right, now they got fifteen thousand or so on a Sunday morning. And so they got they got a minister, I think his name is Dallas somebody Jenkins. Anyway, they got a whole minister who who is the minister of like film. Like like his job is to make movies for the church. Like that's his job. And uh I mean I I don't know how many staff members you would have to have where you go down the list from senior pastor till you get to minister of film. Like I don't know how many, you know, how many it takes but they, they got the, it's a show that they, they crowdsourced it. And they, they asked people to donate. He had done a little Christmas movie. They filmed them right there in Texas. And they had uh, built the sets and everything. And they did a little Christmas movie. And, uh, and then they said, well, we want to make a movie, or uh, make a show, uh, you know, about Jesus. And they raised something like nearly $12 million from people donating money to make this show about Jesus and uh, which you know that's fine uh, but to me uh, I've read the book it's pretty good uh, you know <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't need to show myself. 
But uh, uh, I'm always kind of interested to see how they portray Jesus and the apostles because, you know, just like any book, uh, the way each reader imagines the characters is going to be a little different. And I'm always, uh, I'll tell you all this too, I'm always interested to see because of denominational and theological differences, I want to see what they change. I want to see what they leave out, and I want to see what they add to it. And these are, uh, this church is kind of a non-denominational, Protestant, basically kind of a Baptist type church. And there's some moments in there where they put a little few words in Jesus' mouth where I'm like, he didn't, he didn't say that. Uh, that's not exactly what the Lord said. So um, it's always interesting to see how he's portrayed. But I will say this, that the, the guy they've got um, portraying Jesus uh, is exceptionally good. Um, he's exceptionally good. Uh, they, uh, they went out and found a guy who, he, just, he, he does a fine job. So, so in that regard, they've done, and I do think they are stepping forward with the best of intentions. These are people of faith trying to speak to faith. Uh, so I think there's, there's a great um, uh, effort in that. And, and so overall, I think it's worth uh, watching. Um, the trouble is that uh, we have these statistically, that people, uh, Christians under 40, so you know, about my age and under, the level of biblical literacy is at an all-time low among practicing Christians. Fewer people, people who attend church, fewer read their Bible now than have ever have in the past. Uh, and I know that's certain because I look at some of the Bible, Bible study materials that come out, and then you got nothing to do with the Bible. They're like, oh, we're going to have a Bible study. Oh, great. And here's the book we're reading by <laughs> Max Lucado or whoever. And you're like, well, I thought we were having a Bible study. How about, you know, the book written by... Luke. I mean, <laughs> why not that, you know? Um, and that's becoming increasingly rare, actually, of people studying the Bible. They end up reading books about the Bible that are filtered, or they read a different book, or whatever. And so for people under the age of 40, which is kind of who this show is targeted at, biblical literacy is at an all-time low. And the danger in that, of course, is... The more you change for the purposes of the show, the more uninformed people are going to be confused because they don't know the Bible well enough to know the differences. So that's that's kind of a that's kind of a, a dangerous thing there. Um, the trouble is, the Bible is something that people have struggled in reading and understanding since Moses first wrote the thing down. Um, Y'all may remember that even in ancient times, all the boys went to Hebrew school, and they learned Torah and what they call Tanakh. And, and Tanakh is really kind of the Hebrew, it's almost like an acronym, if you will, for the entire Old Testament. The Ta comes from the Torah, uh, the Na comes from, I think, the writings, whatever the Hebrew word for that is, and the Tanakh, the Ka comes from the histories, however it works. I'm, I'm butchering that. I'm no good at Hebrew, all right? Um, but the Tanakh is basically uh, the word for the Old Testament. Now, you know, that's, that's kind of the way that goes. Um, and from, from the earliest days, people struggled with that. Uh, that is why it, even the great scribes and Pharisees had trouble understanding uh, the messiahship of Christ because uh, they didn't quite understand the prophecies concerning the messiah. If they had understood them correctly, uh, they might not have been so shocked when Jesus showed up or they might not have rejected him so severely. Um, so um, people have always struggled with scripture. And, um, and I'll say this, um, Scripture scripture's different from other books. Um, I mean, I read it for a living, literally. Um, but I mean, I was, I'll be honest, I was not the coolest kid in school. 
And um, I, I, I was that kid. I had a Bible in my book bag, uh, just an, a little NIV Bible that the Fellowship of Christian Athletes had given me. And during downtime, I would, I would read the Bible and, uh, and get my little highlighter pen and go through my New Testament. Because um, I figured, you know, if, if you're going to be a Christian, you're supposed to read this thing. And uh, it's crazy, right? Crazy. Um, the other kids certainly thought it was. Uh, they'd be like, why are you reading it? And I'm like, aren't, don't y'all go to church too? Like, aren't we supposed to be reading this book? And uh, especially at Methodist, man, the Methodists thought I was crazy reading that thing. Um, <laughs> I didn't know any other Methodist that read it. So, um, you know, I, I, I've always kind of been intrigued by Scripture. Um, my mother was a prolific reader of the Bible. Um, I mean, from the time I was very young, my mother read her Bible, read it, uh, every day, had that thing bookmarked and dog-eared and highlighted, and I mean, her Bible, she had one of those parallel Bibles, it's like four different translations in there, and her whole Bible would just be falling apart, um, and, and she, from the time I was little, she would give me the little, like, here, learn your Bible stories, you know, here's a record of Burl Ives telling Bible stories with, a book to go with it or she'd buy me Bible action figures and I mean if that doesn't like everybody else got G.I. Joe and He-Man I'm over here with like Peter like hear the word of the Lord like you know like this. <laughs> I'm like those Flanders kids I don't know uh, <laughs> but uh, no I had G.I. Joe too it was either G.I. Joe or Bible stories that's what we had at my like oh my G.I. Joe like I, my G.I. Joe's had a real problem in that, you know, they didn't want to shoot the cobras. They wanted to hand them tracks and get them saved, you know. I'd, I'd be inventing chaplains for my G.I. Joe. Like, oh, here's a new G.I. Joe. He's the chaplain. He's great. Um, so, <laughs> um, we, uh, but people struggle with Scripture, okay? Um, it's hard sometimes to understand. And it's hard to figure out where to start. And this was something that I saw early on uh, because I didn't realize everybody's mama didn't read the Bible like mine did. Uh, mama read that Bible every day. And she would talk to us about it every day. All of our bedtime stories, mother would tell us a Bible story. Uh, if daddy told us one, it would be like, here's a story about the Civil War. Okay, that's what we learned from daddy. But, um, but mama told us all these tremendous Bible stories. And um, I, you know, going to Sunday school, my brother and I generally knew all the answers. And the other kids did not always know the answers. And uh, when I went, you know, and of course, being a good Methodist, I went to Methodist summer camp. You go to Methodist summer camp, I mean, every summer. And, and I would go, uh, as you get older, they had one week during the summer that was for high school kids. So that was great because it's like old home week. You see the same ones from all over the state every week. And uh, go to Camp Lake Stevens. And I still have friends from going to Camp Lake Stevens. Uh, and uh, we'd have, every, you know, on Wednesday night, generally or Tuesday night, one of the nights of the week, they'd play Bible trivia. And it'd be like Jeopardy. And it'd be, it'd be a whole, you know, the whole championship. And the entire four years that I was there every every year. I was like that guy, guy, Ken Jennings. Like, I never missed a question. I won every year Bible trivia. And I remember my brother, when my brother would come with me, he'd get so put, he'd be like, y'all, don't even try it. All the reads is Bible. Like, <laughs> all the reads that thing. He's not going to miss a question. Um, I'd, I'd take on the counselors and beat them. Um, the, other, the other thing, too, my grandfather, uh, my dad's dad read the Bible prolifically. Um, and he read the King James Bible. He wasn't playing around. And he memorized it. And he, I'd seen him in my life. He would start on a Sunday evening. And he'd lay down on his old couch. And he'd start reading. And he would be closing the book by the next Saturday night, having just finished Revelation. Starting Genesis He'd read the entire Bible in a week, put that thing down. And I've seen him do that no less than three times 
in my lifetime. Like he would just go for a while and then he'd go, well, I need to go read my Bible. And when he said, I need to go read the Bible, he would literally read the entire Bible, <laughs> read the whole thing. And uh, the, man, the man knew it and could quote it to you. And there was a, I always thought that as far as people of faith went, uh, I've raised this way, there's a moral authority that comes with the understanding of Scripture. You know, when my granddaddy would look at me and quote something out of Micah, uh, there was a moral authority. You couldn't argue with that. That's better than elbow patches on your blazer. I mean, you can't argue with that. So, uh, but to understand Scripture and to be able to, to deal with it and, and to preach it uh, is a whole other thing. And I want us to understand that that's, that is empowered here by the Spirit. So Jesus comes to his disciples here and says, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened. Now, th just think about that. The Bible says they were terrified and frightened. All right? Luke could have left it at, they were scared. All right? Luke could have left it at, they were, they were terrified and frightened. This is serious business. And suppose they had seen a spirit. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And he showed them his hands and his feet. Notice the subtle difference here. In John's gospel from last week, what was it? Hands and his side. But here in Luke, it's hands and feet. Slightly different reference to the wounds. Slightly different reference to the wounds. Um, and he uh, would have had, of course, the holes remain his marks of glory. Um, when he said this, he showed his hands and feet, but while they still, not did, they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said, have you any food here? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Now, I get to this point, because in that new show, The Chosen, uh, as Jesus is recruiting his disciples, uh, the show has decided to include among them Mary Magdalene. And undoubtedly, uh, Jesus was a close, close friend of Mary Magdalene, says that she was delivered from possession of demons, that tries to free her from demons. But in the TV show, the way they portrayed it is that she is the first one that he interacts with and, and that she travels with the boys. She travels with Jesus and the Twelve all throughout the countryside in the show. And I can tell you that that, that is in no way backed up by Scripture. Uh, that would have been seen as largely inappropriate for, for a woman to be traveling with this group of unmarried men. That would have been seen as a bit inappropriate and questionable. Um, uh, I'm sure the show is trying to play somewhat to modern sensibilities and, oh, there was a woman that was that. Uh, that's not at all scriptural. But I would hold this up as evidence, this passage right here, that there were no women among the disciples. And I'm going to tell you why. Because if Jesus had just gotten back up from the dead and showed up at supper, you know one of those women would have been said, let me fix you a plate right now. That's what they would have said. But he did not. He had to stand around and ask for something to eat. And then all they had was fish and honeycomb. What kind of meal? I'll tell you what kind of meal. That's bachelor's delight. Ain't nothing but a bunch of men in there who ain't thinking about supper. So that tells you right there there were no women hanging out with the disciples. Um, and so he took it and eats it in their presence. That also tells you he wasn't married. You know if he'd have been married, he'd have been, had to go home and eat supper with his family. He was a single man. Uh, then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So he, he's including the whole Tanakh, not just the Torah, but the whole Old Testament. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Now, that's important. 
Uh, and John, he says, what? Receive the Holy Spirit. He breathes on them. But here, he sort of, he sort of says that he opened their understanding. Um, that's an important point because Paul's going to talk about this later when he talks about the gifts of the Spirit, not the fruits, but the gifts. And he lists among them, of course, preaching and teaching. Um, now, we had some, some guys in seminary, and I mean nice people, wonderful folks, some of whom were really good scholars. I mean, some of those guys could actually do Hebrew. Um, but they were terrible preachers. Uh, they just didn't have the gift for preaching. Uh, public presentation was not something that they could do well. And I want to say this, uh, preaching, um, it's, uh, it's its own discipline. And I've been doing it now for 15 years, so I might have an opinion on this. Uh, I'm not up here to entertain you primarily, though I do need to entertain you to hold your attention. I'm not up here just to teach because I'm not here just to give information for the sake that you learn something although I am here to teach you something. I am not up here to sell you something because what I'm giving you is nothing you can buy with money. We are here to compel you to believe and come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, that you might find salvation in Christ. And so there are other disciplines like entertainment, like teaching, uh, like arguments uh, that all kind of come into play but, but, but preaching is its own thing, and it's a gift of God. It's a calling of God because it is absolutely, you have to have the understanding of the scriptures in order for it to make sense. And that comes through the Spirit. That comes from Christ. That we cannot just understand the scriptures rightly on our own. That comes from Christ. Now, that's great. Um, what does that mean? What do we do now that Jesus is gone? I mean, Jesus shows up here on the day of Easter to give them this gift and to be there. And he goes on, he tells them, he says, Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and, and this is really important, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Uh, that's really where he's summarizing exactly what I just kind of said. What's the point of this preaching? The whole point of the preaching is, thus it is written, is necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. That's really it. That's the whole point. And the, the work of the preacher and the whole point of the scriptures is to demonstrate how Christ is present and pointed to throughout the entire story of salvation and how it matters in our lives and can be applied on a daily basis. But the whole point of that is to bring us into relationship and thus into salvation by repenting from our sins and finding for redemption through Jesus Christ. That's it. Now, when you go through the scriptures and you read all that and all these stories, and there's some crazy stories. Like I reread Samson a couple weeks ago in Bible study. That story is crazy. Have y'all read Samson lately? I mean, there was a whole lot about that story that I was like, I don't remember that part. Um, there's a whole lot in Scripture that you're like, where is Jesus in this part? Samson at one point kills a thousand Philistines with an old jawbone from a donkey. And you're going to be like, how am I going to relate to that in my daily life? I'm just going to Safeway today. I ain't, I ain't even picking up donkey jawbones. Are they on sale? What are we doing? What are we doing? Um, the whole Carrie, you ever see jump, donkey jaw bones on sale at the grocery? I haven't looked for them. Two for one at Safeway. That's what I hear this week. I, I haven't know. looked, but I don't you know. You should. All right. Listen, if you do get two for one, one. get one for me. <laughs> All right. Um, the, the, the it, 
takes Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit to open the Scriptures to us. And the reason that He comes to them as a group, the reason He comes to them, I mean, now, if we're, if we're combining stories here, which is always a little iffy, Dr. Hayes would tell me to slow down a minute, but if we're going to combine the stories, this is that night of Easter, so everybody but Judas and, from last week, Thomas was present. So ten of the apostles are here. And he's telling them he opened their understanding. I think the plurality of that is very important. In coming weeks, when we read about his walk to Emmaus, he's going to see that he, he visits with two of his followers and that he's going to explain the Old Testament to them as well. Now, the part where I get a little bit frustrated is the fact that Luke didn't write any of that down. I mean, especially on the walk to Emmaus. We'll talk more about it. But, I mean, it says that he explained... From the very beginning, through all the all the testament about all the prophecies about him from stem to stern in the Old Testament. Do, do, you, do you know how much that would be worth to the church right now? Do you have any idea? The seminary could be skipped entirely to just read this long book that Jesus dictated about how he's in it from stem to stern. Um, we we could skip all these commentaries. Some German scholar was like, I think he is in that. When you read it, shut up. We're going to hear from Jesus. All right? But Luke didn't record that. And he doesn't record it here. I think what's important is that, uh, here, here's the deal, folks. He's basically telling us to listen to the Holy Spirit because the Spirit will guide us in our understanding guide us. Not in isolation. Because boy, when you try to get this stuff on your own, you get up in the wrong place. But when the church adheres to Scripture, adheres to the Orthodox tenets that have been set down before us, we come together prayerfully and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us that our collective understanding is still guided by, from, and to Christ. See, uh, what, what, what Jesus does for him at Emmaus is basically explain that he is the point of the Old Testament from stem to stern. What we've been doing theologically for the past 2,000 years is coming together in the power of the Holy Spirit trying to unpack that. Trying to figure out how well that worked. Now I can tell you, even if Luke had written it all down and they had slipped me that cheat sheet at seminary, they'd have been like, look, Oliver, we know you spend too much time at the basketball games. Please go ahead and just read these crib notes. I could have written that down on the test. And the professor would have still been like, where are you getting this? See, you know, it would get ridiculous. Um, we don't arrive at the truth all at once. And it's a bumpy, long road to get there. The journey that the church makes theologically to our understanding about the Holy Trinity, about the two natures of Christ, about the, the divinity of Christ and the Holy Spirit, all those things. That road has been long and rocky and difficult. But that's also how you forge family, right? Anybody who's close to their siblings, some of your best memories are going to be those hard-earned ones that you got in the back of that station wagon taking family vacations, right? right? That's how it works. He hit me. No, I didn't. I will hit you. Shut up. <laughs> you know, that's, that's how it is. That's how, that's that good family time. And those are the memories that you carry. Uh, the church is like that. How we've learned to do theology together is part of what has forged the church. If he had just given us the answers, uh, we wouldn't have had that work to do together. It's hard. Uh, the understanding of the scriptures comes from Christ 
through the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, it's amazing how many important and brilliant thinkers, theologians, philosophers, just get it absolutely wrong. Just get it absolutely wrong. And I'm not saying that by my measuring stick. I'm say, saying that in comparison to the Orthodox tenets of the church. Right? Um, Dr. Wainwright, the great Methodist theologian, my mentor, used to say, uh, read theology with trepidation. We must do it always comparing it to the scriptures and with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Some people are on their way into faith and some people are on their way out. And it takes a careful eye of discernment guided by the living God uh, to help us know the difference. And uh, and I, I tell you, I didn't I didn't understand that last bit when he told us, you know, there we were, young, bushy tailed and bright eyed, and we're all there in his class, intro to theology, thinking, what who's on their way out? What does that mean? But here I am, uh, for about 18 years later from that class, and I've seen it. I've seen guys that I've studied under find their way out of Orthodox Christian faith. Um, why? Because they didn't adhere to the scriptures and I don't know that they were paying close enough attention to the guidance and spirit. And I've also uh, seen people find their way in. Find their way in. Because if you think about Jesus and you talk about Jesus and you hang around the church long enough, uh, you're giving him a better than average chance of bringing you into the fold. I mean, if you're just a wild sheep out there, but you start hanging out in the Lord's pasture and hanging around with the Lord's sheep, you, you might just find yourself following the good shepherd. And, and so I end this week with a, uh, a kind of positive story, it's a true story, uh, that I was kind of uh, excited to hear. So uh, about, about 15 years ago, when I got out of seminary, there was a novel that came out by a British author named Susanna Clark, and she wrote a, a tremendous, huge novel called Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. I don't know if you've ever heard of this book. Uh, about came out about 2003, 2004. Huge book. Her first novel, brilliant, brilliant. It was almost like a cross between, I don't know, uh, Harry Potter and Jane Austen. It was just really, and just tremendously clever, funny, well-written, just excellent. And uh, Ms. Clark is an Oxford graduate. Um, but but mo more interesting than that for me is Ms. Clark is the daughter of a British Methodist minister. But like a lot of uh, intellectuals and, and what's become popular in England, she uh, kind of left her childhood faith behind. As she went to school, she was too educated and too articulate and uh, uh, too erudite among the elite of the, the British literary scene to, to admit to faith. Uh, and she wrote this great, this great book. I mean, it was huge. And, uh, and it was so well received by everyone and, and, and everyone that she's, she's the next great thing. And it had taken her 10 years to write this book. And so she, uh, you know, people said, oh, she's better than J.K. Rowling. You know, she's so much smarter. And, uh, and I read the book, and I'll be honest, I mean, this thing was 900 some odd pages, and I couldn't put it down. And I would see in the book little bits of, I mean, this is a fantasy book. And, and she, would, she, she would talk about, it's kind of an alternate history of England uh, if magic had been real. And so you can imagine this is an impressive tome of research and of uh, what if and, and historical connotation and also an understanding of fairy tales and magic. And it's a huge work of epic, epic research. And it's funny. Um, and she writes this thing, but in her retelling of English history, 
she would include little bits of John Wesley. Wouldn't talk about religion, but she would talk about the good things that John Wesley had done. And you could see that even though she had kind of given up the church and had given up faith, that there were parts of her upbringing, maybe just the social parts, that she still said, well, of course that was a good thing. When Wesley stood up against slavery, when Wesley stood up against poverty, when Wesley reached out to the disenfranchised. And then she talked about magic in a way that if I, as a, as a one who had studied theology professionally, it sounded like she was talking about religion. That in her day, in modern terms, um, magic was no longer actually studied. It was just talked about. What's, what passed for the study of magic was actually just writing on the history of magic and what had supposedly occurred. As you could tell that her Oxford education and her being drawn away from religion had left an impact on her about how the form of religion had, had become in modern England. And then she had told us she was going to write a sequel to her great novel. And it never came. And I thought to myself, well, it took her 10 years to write the first. It'd probably take her at least that to write a good sequel. But it didn't come. It didn't come. And so for, for nearly 15 years, we waited and waited. And finally this past year, just in September, she has written a second novel. Not a sequel at all, but rather something of an homage uh, to C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. A short book but it was tremendously well received. And so, I told Kate to fire up Amazon and get me that book. And so she did. And it arrived, and I was very excited. And I uh, found myself over the years, as I look back on that big novel, praying, strangely, for Miss Clark. Because I think because of her Methodist heritage, I felt sort of a kinship to this lady. And I had a great admirer of her work and her intellect. And I also felt hope that she'd find her faith again. And so the other day, I just on a whim Googled up Susanna Clark, Christianity. And I found an article from last year, just after the book had come out, uh, published by a magazine put out by the Church of England where they had interviewed Miss Clark on her faith. And she wrote, or she said, that during the time between her first book and her second, she had been diagnosed with chronic fatigue and her health had suffered greatly. And that to try as she might to write that sequel, she couldn't find the energy. And that her immune system had suffered greatly. And she'd been sick so many years and that in that time, and being so down, that she started to go to church again. And that she tried to go to the Methodist church, but I don't blame her for this one bit, but the British Methodist church had nothing to offer her. And I can tell you from experience, I'm not surprised, unfortunately. But she started attending the Church of England. And she remembered Lewis, and she remembered Wesley, and she found her faith again, slowly, quietly. She said that she had to shake off all the heretical questions that she had picked up at Oxford, those bad theological habits, but that she had found healing and strength and the courage to write this short homage to Lewis as she found her faith again. I'm encouraged by that. I would recommend the books to anyone, but I was encouraged by that because um, we can wander, I think. I don't know if you feel this way. Some of you have grown children, and I do not yet. But boy, I worry about them. I think what, what draws me to, to Ms. Clark is the fact that her father was a Methodist preacher who obviously was very proud of his daughter when she found her way to Oxford. That's not an unfamiliar story. Uh, Maggie Thatcher attended Oxford, and her father was a Methodist preacher. And Maggie Thatcher, by the way, kind of lost her faith at Oxford as well. 
And I have, uh, you know, I don't like to tell, I mean, we don't brag, we're not bragging. Kate did very well in school, she went to Harvard, and she would love it if the boys attended a good school. I want them at VMI, but they're doing push-ups and staying out of trouble. I do, but, but, but Kate wants them to go to a good school, and I don't blame her. Of course you want the best for your children, but I worry, would the sons of a Methodist preacher be able to keep their faith? And all of us, I think, with adult children, right? We worry. We worry. Will our children find faith? Will they find faith? Will they heed the words of Scripture? And I'm encouraged because this passage tells me something. It tells me that understanding the Scriptures and that understanding their meaning and having a living faith about what they mean is not really my responsibility. It ain't up to me in the end. James and Thomas are going to find their relationship with Jesus because of Jesus. The apostles don't understand the scriptures without the blessing of Jesus. And it also tells me that if the apostles who had seen the Lord raised from the dead and still needed his guidance to understand the scriptures, uh, there's hope for all of our children. There's hope for Ms. Clark who it took getting terribly ill for the Lord to be able to whisper to her to come home. And so I think there's great hope in this passage that um, not to worry so much about those who aren't being reached, even those close to us. God has a plan, and God in his own time will reach out to them in a way that they can best hear him. And I find that encouraging. The world is a scary place, and increasingly so. And I wonder about the fate and faith of my children. What I find comforting here is that it's not all up to me. That they're in better hands than my own. That all of our children... And their relationship to God is ultimately in Jesus' hands. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us close this morning with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.